Judge Jeanine Pirro. She's the outspoken host. Judge Jeanine Pirro is dominating the headlines right now. This is the Judge Jeanine Tunnel to Towers Foundation Sunday Morning Show on 77 WABC. Now, here's Judge Jeanine Pirro. Welcome, everyone, to the Judge Jeanine Pirro Tunnel to Towers Foundation Sunday Morning Show. Happy Sunday, everybody. On this Sunday, December 18th of 2021, it is the last Sunday before you know what. Christmas Day. I hope everyone is enjoying their day so far. It's a great morning here in New York City, and as always, we are armed and ready to serve justice. With all my great listeners here on Talk Radio 77 WABC and all listening to our stream on the WABCRadio.com and the 77 WABC mobile app. Later on in the show, I'll reveal the results of our question of the week. But there is so much that happened in America this week. You know what, uh, folks? I'd like to be able to come on and say nothing really happened in the country uh, this week. So let's listen to some music. But that ain't never going to happen. So, uh, so much happened this week. I mean, you've got Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats still talking about Build Back Better. You got Joe Biden saying he's going to win and you GOPers, you better, you better watch out, pal, because Joe Biden's coming after you, whatever that means. And the COVID is back. The mask mandates for the new Omicron. Uh, and in New York City, December 27, uh, you know, B- B- Bill de Blasio, uh, Bozo there, he wants to make sure that everybody in every building is vaccinated. I mean, the guy won't stop. He ought to just leave with whatever dignity he has. But we'll get to all those topics and break it all down for you here on the Judge Jeanine Pirro Tunnel to Towers Foundation Sunday morning show. Plus, later on in the show, I'm going to gavel out with my closing art. I'll also reveal the new question of the week that you don't want to miss. I always love your participation, as you know, in the weekly polls on the topics that matter here on Justice in America. It's all coming up in just a few moments on the Judge Jeanine Pirro Tunnel to Towers Foundation Sunday morning show. But first, it's time for my opening statement. Now, I have to tell you, everyone, when I decide to write an opening statement, you know, I think about what's happened during the week. And, I, you know, a lot of it, you know, it's political. It's just political. It's, it's, it can be law and order. It can be crime because, uh, of course, that's my wheelhouse. But, you know, tonight or, or today, last night when I was writing this, uh, I, I was thinking about the holidays and Christmas and the Christmas spirit. So uh, today's open is a Christmas carol to Nancy Pelosi. A Christmas Carol, of course, was written by Charles Dickens. In it, Ebenezer Scrooge is an elderly man who is visited by the ghosts of his past, and he is confronted with the mistakes that he has made in the past. You know the the movie where they come out in chains and he goes to bed and he's in his nightcap and his nightgown and all the ghosts come to visit him to talk about all the terrible things that he's done. Well, this Christmas carol is for Nancy Pelosi. The question for Ebenezer Scrooge or our own Nancy Pelosi is whether redemption is even available to her. Now, I the way I would write it is the first ghost to visit Nancy Pelosi is the ghost of lawlessness in America. As the lead Democrat in Congress, Nancy could have stopped this, but she refused to do so. In fact, she says she doesn't even understand where the lawlessness comes from. And she stood in front of uh, uh, the press and she says, it's outrageous. I don't know where it comes from. Do you? Nancy, Nancy, Nancy. You don't know where the lawlessness comes from? It's in your city of San Francisco where people don't even want to walk their dogs because of the human feces on the street, because of needles lining the street, and because they don't want to get caught up in crime that's enveloping the once magnificent San Francisco that was ruined under your reign. And admit it. The only reason, Nancy, that you even mention lawlessness for the first time in December is because you Democrats see the poll numbers. 
67% of Americans are unhappy with the way the Democrats are handling crime. They are fed up. The American people are fed up with the loss of law and order, with rampant chaos on our streets, with the unprovoked assaults, the senseless, brutal crimes, convicted felons let out of jail long before their release date by Democrat prosecutors, Democrat governors. You know, Nancy, you are a legislator in the end. The elimination of cash bail under the guise of social justice has created a revolving door of criminals walking into and out of police stations never to return. And that assumes they're even arrested in the first place. You do know that it was in your precious state of California where criminals are now allowed to steal less than a thousand dollars repeatedly and not be prosecuted, not be arrested. So they repeatedly and serially hit stores over and over and over again till they get to thirty, forty, fifty thousand. As long as they do it one at a time, then they sell their stolen goods on the streets of San Francisco while you and your liberal rich pals look the other way and eat unmasked at the French Laundry. Yes, Nancy, I am the ghost of the past telling you that you helped create the lawlessness that is destroying my country. Another ghost that would visit Nancy Pelosi under my Christmas carol is a ghost of immigration. And while we suffer from hordes of unvaccinated illegals surging into our country in the middle of a pandemic, we are left to deal with individuals who are criminals, mules for the cartels, and human smugglers. Our children are dying from fentanyl sent by China through the Mexican cartels, secretly added to counterfeit pills like Xanax that kill our children in an undeclared war on Americans. Gang members come through unquestioned, who then go on to maim and kill innocent Americans, some of them teenagers. And what is your answer about MS-13 and the other gang members who carry out barbaric, brutal, medieval violence against innocent American victims? When you were asked about these thugs who maim and kill as part of their initiation, you say, They are all children of God. Nancy, children of God, that's your answer? That's your answer, Nancy, to the MS-13 gang members who come into this country, in New York City, all over New York, who brutally beat to the point where you can only identify a victim from his dental records? And Nancy, another ghost to visit you? The ghost of greed. That's a big one for you, honey. You've made millions, hundreds of millions of dollars since you've been in Congress. But you're like so many who enter Congress of moderate means, cover each other's backs, so you can all reap the benefits of the insider information that you get, of the laws that you pass the information that ordinary Americans have no information about. And this week you were advised, this week, after a five-month investigation by Business Insider, the 49 members of Congress and 182 senior congressional staffers violated the Stock Act, the Insider Trading Law, and your reaction? Well, as long as they file i mean we are you know we are a a capitalist society we should be able to invest this brought a huge negative response from fellow democrats fellow democrats not in congress of course because you all eat from the same tree But, you know, to put this in context, Nancy, since becoming Speaker of the House, regaining the uh, gavel as Speaker in 2018, your total assets went from $114 million to $271 million in 2019 
to 315 million in 2020. 60 Minutes even accused your husband Paul of insider trading. And Nancy, lying to the American public is another ghost that will always haunt you because as Speaker of the House, you have set the tone and the policy for all of us. Your lies are too many to identify, but this week, my favorite one was when you said you didn't know what causes the lawlessness. The ghosts of Christmas past are all around you, Nancy. I have no idea how you can change what has already happened, and I have no faith that greed and selfishness and lying that you engage in will ever change. In A Christmas Carol, Scrooge learns the errors of his ways and seeks redemption. I'm not so sure that that is how your Christmas carol ends, Nancy. But hey, it's the Christmas season. Anything's possible, even for you. And that's my opening statement here on the Judge Jeanine Pirro, Tunnel to Towers Foundation Sunday morning show. And up here next on the Judge Jeanine Pirro, Tunnel to Towers Foundation Sunday morning show, we will be speaking with author and journalist Mitch Album. Coming up right here on Talk Radio 77 WABC. Tip in the scales when all else fails. The Judge Janine Tunnel to Towers Foundation Sunday Morning Show. Now, here's Judge Janine Pirro. Welcome back to the Judge Janine Pirro Tunnel to Towers Foundation Sunday Morning Show. And a special shout out as well for those of you joining us via our live stream on the 77 WABC mobile app and on WABCradio.com streaming worldwide. And for those with Alexa smart home speakers, you can tune in as well by simply saying, Alexa, enable the 77 WABC skill. Now, joining us now is a guest that I'm very excited about. He is an American author, a journalist. His books have sold more than 40 million copies worldwide. Please join me in welcoming Mitch Album to the Judge Janine Tunnel to Towers Foundation Sunday morning show. Uh, good morning, Mitch. How are you? Uh, good morning, Judge. I'm fine. Thank you. All right. Well, we're delighted that you could join us here. Uh, you are uh, really an icon. Your books, uh, everything from Tuesdays with Maury, Have a Little Faith, and the novel The Five People You Meet in Heaven, uh, I mean, you are just a master when it comes to these books and true stories, I might add. Uh, how did you get involved in writing these stories that literally hit at the heart of not just Americans, but people worldwide? Well, uh, I, I kind of had two careers. Uh, for the first uh, 10, 12 years or so, I was a sports writer and really pretty deep into all of that. And I was on TV and radio and just did sports. And then uh, when I was 37, I uh, re-encountered my old college professor, Maury Schwartz, when I accidentally saw him on TV talking to Ted Koppel about what it was like to die from Lou Gehrig's disease. And I went to visit him once, once turned to twice, twice turned to every Tuesday that he had left in his life. Oh. And I ended up writing a little book to pay his medical bills for him about what, you know, what an old man tells a young man when he really realizes he's going to die and, and you know, what's important in life. And I thought I would go back to sports writing, you know, after that. But that little book, uh, which was just written to pay his medical bills, um, <laughs> turned into the most popular memoir of all time and kind of got me more writing into those types of things than sports. Well, it, it, it you had to be stunned to go from sports to, you know, detailing, uh, you know, the memoirs of a man who is, you know, facing death in the face. And certainly Tuesdays with Maury, uh, as you say, is just a blockbuster. It was a mega hit. And so then you went to have a little faith in the five people you meet in heaven. Um, but now your latest book is A Stranger in the Lifeboat. And I just want to, Mitch Album, before I, I talk about this, I want my listeners to know that you and wife have started an orphanage in Port-au-Prince in Haiti and that you operate six other charities, including the first ever 24 hour medical clinic for homeless children in the United States. I mean, you are a real giver. This did Tuesdays with Maury change your life as well. Yes, it did judge. I mean, uh, honestly, I saw Maury one time 
uh, people would come and visit him and they'd want to cheer him up, but he would always end up turning the conversation to them, asking them what their life was like, helping them out. And I said to him one time, I don't get it. You're dying from this terrible disease and all you want to do is help these other people. Why don't you just accept their sympathy and say, let's not talk about your problems. Let's talk about mine. And he said, Mitch, why would I ever take from people like that? Taking just makes me feel like I'm dying. Giving makes me feel like I'm living. And I never forgot that. I I said, wow, this is how it works when you're dying, that the thing that makes you feel most alive is giving to people. Then that must be true all the other days of your life. And I have found, you know, with those charities and with the orphanage, which I'm at every month, it'll be 12 years next month. Uh, I'm there every month, and we have 53 beautiful children that we raise there. Wow. And uh, I never feel more alive than when I'm there. Well, you know, with with Tuesdays with Maury, I mean, you had to stop and think about our society. Do we, Mitch Album, do we talk enough in our society about the inevitable, about death, or do we just kind of ignore it and just kind of put people away in hospice and call it a day? What do you think of how yeah. America? Yeah, I, I think Americans uh, uh, shove death to the side, shove older people to the side. We don't want to think about getting older or getting sicker. And then all of a sudden it's forced upon us. Maury used to say, pretend you have a bird on your shoulder every day and and you check with that bird each morning. You say, it's the day, the day I'm going to die. And of course, every morning except one, the bird's going to say no. But on the day that it says yes, have you lived your life expecting that? Have you lived your life, you know, doing the things you wanted to do, realizing that any day that bird could say yes? And most of us don't. Most of us, you know, delay things and put things off. And then all of a sudden we get a bad diagnosis or we realize we're older than we thought. And then it's like, well, wait, 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 wait. I, you know, I haven't done this yet. I haven't done this. Yet. Well, you know, you, you, the life doesn't work like that. So, yeah, no, I that, agree that we put things off. And and then we're shocked, like, oh, no, you know, I have the big C or whatever it might be. Yeah. But, you know, Mitch, a, a friend of mine was in hospice, a very dear friend. And I said to her, I said, Mariana, I said, you know, what would you have done more of if you had more time? And she said to me, I would have laughed more. I didn't laugh enough. Mm, and wow. I kind of, I kind of try every day to think about that. But like, but, but Mitch album, your, your new book is a story about, um, uh, what stranger in a lifeboat you ponder what we would do if after crying out for divine help, God actually appeared before us. You have a religious right. strain in the books now, your latest stranger in the lifeboat, which I might add. And by the way, to my listeners, Mitch has not asked me to do this. I just believe in this man. He is a very powerful man with a powerful message. The book is Stranger in the Lifeboat. You can get it everywhere. But tell us a little bit about the stranger in the lifeboat. So it begins with this uh, one of the richest men in the world has a luxury yacht, and he invites all his famous rich friends on it for a week. And mysteriously, during the voyage, it, it explodes, and everybody on the yacht is killed except 10 people who managed to get to a life raft, five of the rich guests and five of the staff members. And they're out in this lifeboat for three days. Nobody is coming for them. They're running out of food. There are sharks in the water. They're crying out for help. And then all of a sudden they see this body floating in the ocean. And they pull it in, and it's this young man, a very nondescript, average-looking guy. And they pepper him with questions, and he doesn't say anything. And finally one of the passengers says, well, thank the Lord we found you. And he says, I am the Lord. And it's what happens from that point forward uh, when, you know, all these people who have been crying out for help, nonetheless, don't believe that this guy is who he says he is because he doesn't look like it. You know, he's he's thin and he gets hungry and he falls asleep and he gets a. And so it's really kind of a parable about uh, when we call out for help, if it doesn't come exactly the way we want it, do we believe that our prayers aren't being answered? And you have to sort of follow the book to find out what happens. But it was. It was pretty interesting to be able to sort of put words in a character who believes that he's God's mouth, because, you know, a lot of the questions that I'm sure you would ask God if God was a guest on your radio show, which, (laughs) by the way, may may happen uh, sometime soon, uh, then, you know, I got to ask those questions in the book. Well, and and Mitch Album, I mean, you you're always exploring the kind of the essence of God on Earth through through riveting stories that are kind of part 
equal parts mystery and and parable i mean for a sports writer to kind of to kind of come out at that end is really amazing and you (laughs) repeatedly challenge our understanding of faith uh but even more than that i mean in addition by the way that to the charities in in haiti you've got charities in the united states around detroit uh, you you have put into action the money that you've made uh, from these incredible parables. There are allegories that you've made available to all of us that, that you hit a chord in all of us. Why do you think you hit that chord, not just in one book, but in all of your books? Well, I, I try to address the questions that I've heard people ask me after Tuesdays with Maury, you know, I've met so many people around the world who talk to me about issues that came up in that book and particularly loss, for example. I I get so many questions about, you know, what what's the meaning of loss? Why does this happen? And so in The Stranger in the Lifeboat, for example, there's a moment where the one of the passengers asks this God character. He breaks down. He's missing his wife who died a few years ago. And he says, why did she have to die? If you're really God, why did you take her? which is a question that I get asked all the time. And the answer in the book is, well, when people die on earth, the question is always, why did God take them? Maybe a better question would be, why did God give them to us? What Mm -hmm. did we do to deserve their love, their attention, all the memories we made? And he says, "I, I know that you cry for those who die here on earth, but I can assure you they're not crying. And you know, for me, I know that that would be of comfort to people who have lost people. I know yeah. it because I I lost a child a few years ago, and my wife and I adopted one of our kids from Haiti who had a brain tumor, and she passed away, and I had to battle with that whole thing about, well, how can there be a God in the world who is benevolent to, right, to a seven-year-old? But then I began to look at it and say, well, wait a minute. You know, we had her in our lives for a couple of years what did we do to deserve that? We were in our mid-50s. That's way late to get the joy of having a child and being a parent, and yet we were given it. And if you look at it as like we didn't lose a child, we were given one, then you're not as angry and resentful and questioning the, you know, God or the world when things are lost. And I, I thought, well, maybe that'll be of some comfort to other people. So I try to work those kinds of lessons, Judge, into into my stories. Well, that is that is comfort, Mitch Album, and and so you, you kind of take the reader to the celestial realm to seek meaning in in our in our corporal existence. You, I know you're busy, so I'm going to let you go. But I have one more question: In the United States, do you think that that our culture is different from other cultures? In and you know, in what you see, and I, I I'm not intending to be political, and I don't want to be political. Yeah. Um, you know, with the with the resentment that we're getting, you know, that that God and I, you know, I believe in in the separation of church and state, but it's almost as though religion is now kind of like older people in the United States pushed <laughs> under the carpet. Are yeah. we different from other countries? Well, I, I can speak to the countries that I spend a lot of time in. And let me say this, Judge. When I'm in Haiti, I'm with 53 children whose entire possessions can fit into a 12-inch by 12-inch cubby. They have Aww. nothing by comparison to Aww. us. They have no Internet, no phones, no social media, no websites to celebrate themselves, no TikTok videos. And they are the most faithful and joyous kids every night they they say prayers of thanks to god for what they have and that they're alive and they have food to eat now compare that to us we have everything you know there's not a house that doesn't have a television in it and 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 all the things that we don't have are pretty standard here and yet we seem to be moving away from religion there has to be a lesson in that right uh when we, we when we make things for ourselves and make ourselves the center of the universe and we have everything that we need we stop to thinking about well maybe we've been blessed with this and we just sort of start to think well maybe we deserve it you know hey this is this is who we are yeah. we have all this stuff coming to us whereas when you see a culture that has nothing you see people who are so grateful for anything so yeah i think we are different uh and not always in the best way well, uh, that that is a uh, that that certainly is my sense, and I get 
you know, I, sometimes I become very disappointed and it seems that uh, of late, you know, more and more religion is being pushed to the side. And uh, I, I, I'm not, I, I'm not a person who thinks that it should be everywhere, but you know, I went, I went to Catholic schools, Catholic high schools and all that. I was raised as a Roman Catholic and it doesn't matter what your religion is. It's that you believe in, in God and a higher power. Right. But, uh, well, you know, isn't, it, isn't it funny judge how when we are doing well and we're accomplishing everything, we're saying, look at what I've done. But as soon as we get a bad diagnosis, it's like, please, God, take care of this one. You know, <laughs> God, help me. Uh, you're out in the middle of the ocean. God, help me. Why is it that we only cry out for God when we're in trouble, but when good things happen, we somehow think we're responsible for it? God, that is so true. That is so true. It's like all of a sudden God's in our life when we need help. Like, God, yeah. I don't want to have this. Yeah. I don't want this to be cancer or I don't want to go to right. jail or I don't, whatever it might be. Um, it is. And your books now, after Stranger in the Lifeboat, I mean, you're going to continue to write Mitch album. Yep. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Yes. I hope so. As long as I have fingers and, and ideas, I hope so. All right. Well, Mitch Album, it has really been an honor to talk to you. The, uh, uh, to my listeners, the author of Tuesdays with Maury, the best-selling memoir of all time. I mean, this man puts pen, Mitch Album puts pen to paper, and uh, it's just a number one New York Times bestseller. Uh, the latest, The Stranger uh, in the Lifeboat, and uh, I'm looking forward to whatever comes. And by the way, for all you listeners, Mitch is married to a Janine, J-A-N-I-N-E. Right. <laughs> uh, anyway, Mitch, listen, have a wonderful holiday. Merry Christmas. God bless. Merry and Christmas thank you. you for what you do to all of us and for all of us. I was speaking about you before the show started uh, with my son's uh, girlfriend, and she said, oh, yeah, I read Tuesdays with Maury in college. Uh -huh. It was a, one of the best books. And, you know, these kids are hip kids, you know. But yeah. you you strike a chord across the generations, Mitch. God bless you, and thank you. Well, God bless you, too. Thank you, and a Merry Christmas to everybody. All right. Thank you, Mitch. All right, everyone, that was Mitch Album, Stranger in the Lifeboat. The man is a, uh, he is a legend, and uh, he is in the middle of uh, writing more books, as we heard. And so up next in the Judge Janine Pirro Tunnel to Towers Foundation Sunday Morning Show, we're going to be speaking with New York PD Commissioner Dermot Shea. And we're going to ask you our question of the week and tell you how to participate when the Judge Janine Pirro Tunnel to Towers Sunday Morning Show show returns tip in the scales when all else fails the judge janine tunnel the to towers foundation sunday morning show now here's judge janine Puro. so joining me now is the 44th new york city police commissioner dermot shea commissioner shea we are delighted to have you on uh, the tunnel to tower sunday morning show uh, I must tell you, I was reading your background. It's very impressive. Chief of detectives. And, you know, as I read you going up the ranks, you know, from a, uh, you know, graduating from the police academy, patrolman and all that, you know, I, it reminds me uh, of the days when I was DA. I, I must tell you, I don't think there's any better job than being in law enforcement. And uh, I, I don't know if you agree with that, but how many years has it been for you? It's just short of 31 years. Yeah, there was 32 for me. <laughs> All right. So you're coming to the end of your term. Uh, and although you've been there for, you know, let's say 31 years, police commissioner Dermot Shea, uh, it, there were a lot of tumultuous years. Uh, all through those 31 years. But the New York City Police Department, I believe, is probably the best police department in the world. Uh, I have seen them over, I mean, before you, uh, over many, many years. And I believe that the... Uh, uh, that the strength, the training, the uh, comset, all of that stuff is phenomenal. But it just seems that the morale is low right now, and I want to get into that. But first I want to talk about you, Commissioner Shea, and how do you feel about leaving uh, as police commissioner? Well, I, I think it's time. Thanks, Judge, again for having me on. You know, I feel uh, at ease, if you will. You know, it's been a long time, and I'm excited about what comes next. Yeah. Um, you know, lifelong New Yorker, so grew up in Queens and, and have, like you said, have seen the city at many different stages. And, 
you know, incredibly proud of the work that the men and women of this police department have done over the years with, with a lot of help from different partners. Um, it, we're in a tough patch right now, um, and, it, and it's going to take a lot of, you know, coming, finding common solutions together. It's going to take some common sense, and that's been in short supply lately, George. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're and, not and, talking and about – yeah, <laughs> I think we can get where we want to be uh, pretty easily, actually. But we're mm-hmm. going to I don't think people understand the impact of some of these laws um, that have passed over recent years. And um, it's not a switch that can easily be flipped back on without some legislative help. Well, let's let's talk about that. And I assume that uh, from the get go, you're probably talking about this alleged euphemism that they call bail reform, which is nothing more than turn them loose, you know, and the uh, you know, the revolving door of justice. Are you talking about bail reform, Commissioner? Yeah, well, well, I think, Judge, that was the one that broke the camel's back. Mm -hmm. But there was there was a number of policy and legislative changes leading up to that it's over you know over a number of years everything from decriminalizing you know uh, drinking and urination and things of this sort to people saying we're not going to prosecute whole classes of crimes anymore and then there's the raise the age you know so there's there's a number of issues that we were balancing very delicately and holding the line the bail reform was just literally the straw that broke the camel's back because what it did was it put you know uh, many many hardened criminals out on the street both from rikers island and from state prisons but then it also had the double-edged sword of preventing you from easily getting them back in when they're committing new crimes so that's that's what we've been facing you know, we'll we'll continue to hold the line and get our arms around it again. But, you know, you, you know, this is I went up to Albany a couple of weeks ago for the fourth time. This time I brought mothers that have lost their kids to gun violence. Yep. And at yep. some point you, you wonder, like, what is it going to take for legislators to say? All right, well, we, we got to fix this. Well, here's the thing. And, and, uh, to my listeners, we're talking about, uh, we're talking with Commissioner Dermot Shea, uh, the 44th police commissioner of New York City. He's in charge of law enforcement in New York City. Um, all the things that you reference, Commissioner, um, you know, but not prosecuting classes of crime and, uh, you know, raising the age and de- the decriminalization of drinking and urination and all that. Um, it's not a crime to urinate in public anymore. No, it's, it's, they turned it into a civil, civil summons and that's the default. And, and, you know, you can look at marijuana as well, judge, you know, the whole country is moving towards legalization of marijuana. Yeah. But what they did here in New York last year was they said you can smoke it openly outside and that the whole country has not done that. Right. And And then they added into the law that, when a police officer stops a car and somebody's smoking marijuana, don't search the car. So it's just these add-ons that have yeah. really it, – it, you, you have to understand that they're intentionally done by a, 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 a very well-organized fringe that is putting these laws in front of legislators. But you okay. have to understand you know, what their ulterior motive is. And their ulterior motive is what? Uh, they don't believe jails should exist. Okay, so and, but and I wish that was the case, but it's not. Okay, so if you don't think that ba- that jail should exist, then you believe in chaos and anarchy, and these people then are interested in victimizing innocent uh, uh, Americans, innocent citizens, innocent people walking down the street, or they believe that they want to turn this country into a a Marxist communist country. I think they're looking to create a federal police force. But l- there are too many questions I want to ask you. Let's talk about this. Yeah. You, you talk about you know we got to change the law. You got to convince these legislators you know that's fine and dandy these legislators as far as i'm concerned are all part of a club from nancy pelosi my opening statement uh you know this woman is now worth close to 300 million dollars she wasn't worth that when she first came into congress it's all this insider training trading one hand washes the other and the same with these legislators one hand washes the other we got to get their butts out of out of congress we've got to get their tails out of 
Albany. You can't convince these socialists that, you know, look at this woman. She lost her son. You know, you're lucky if they meet them. Look at all the women whose kids were killed by illegals and, and the legislators in, in Congress wouldn't meet with them. So how do we get these legislators out of office? Well, I, I think the only thing that gets their attention is is the people. And that's ultimately, you're hitting on it, that's ultimately who's going to decide, you know, what happens next. I, I think the good news is the public is waking up to this. They shouldn't have to worry about this, but it is directly affecting them now. And they're starting to be educated about really what's happening with the laws and the impact of these laws. And, and I think, uh, you know, my fear is that this is not a, flip of the switch quick solution it's going to take a little time but the, the the shame of it judge is that the people most affected by this is the people that need our help the most and, and these are the people that live in in some of the poorer areas of yeah, the city, that, city right you know are affected most by this crazy defund movement all right let's talk about the defund the police movement a billion dollars taken away from your budget is that accurate yes in okay. last year Last year, by this idiot, I'd like to call him more than that, but it's Sunday, uh, by this idiot de Blasio. I can't wait for that guy to leave. He is the dumbest man I have ever seen in politics. He doesn't deserve to be the dog catcher, but I'm not going to waste time on that. So he defunds a billion dollars, and he gets crime going through the roof, and he says it's the pandemic, and he says he'll get people to talk to each other. Did you ever talk to this idiot and say, look, here's the bottom line. You don't put criminals in jail. They're going to kill people. You get rid of the street crime unit, the, uh, what, what do you call it today, the anti-crime unit, and, you know, the inner city, brown, black people, they're the ones who are going to be hurt. The minorities are the ones who are being hurt, while the dirtbags put guns in their waistbands and look at you like, don't even look at me. Do you ever talk to de Blasio about this crap? Listen, I, I, I talk to all elected officials, judge all the time. I, I think from day one you could say, if anyone looks back, I, I've tried um, to be the voice of reason in terms of representing all New Yorkers and, and warning them about what was happening. And, you know, the shame of it is, and, and I keep coming back to this, but just two years ago, it was our policies in the NYPD that had driven incarceration down to the lowest level in New York City history. I, I you remember. Know, and, and driven crime down. Yep. So we, we, you started off with a very nice compliment, and I thank you. We are the best police department in the world, and we know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But it, it's time that you know some of the uh, the people in elected office recognize that. Well, you know, let's. I, I'm almost speechless with these with these incompetent legislators who are. You know what? Uh, maybe it's shame on me. They're competent. They know what they're doing. They're taking apart this country. They are victimizing people. But let's talk about the, the fact that you've got these legislators who have made these decisions. What about, what about these rogue prosecutors? What, who's the new DA in Manhattan now? I don't even know. Vance is gone? He, he is finishing up, and we're going to have uh, the next elected district attorney, Alvin Bragg, coming in. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Okay, and he, is he a progressive or just a Democrat? Is he one of the progressives? Is well, he has uh, he has put out a uh, a blueprint um, what he plans to do. I can tell you that uh, you know it, it has us in law enforcement concerned. You know, we often hear a lot of things. I think we have to wait and see how that goes. But I, I think that there's no doubt that when you look at, across not just the city but the country, we, we've we've you know, we go from extremes, Judge. We need to be in the middle where the common sense is. Um, mm -hmm. and, and when you start pushing some of these theories, such as people arrested with guns shouldn't be in jail, huh. or not prosecuting shoplifters, or the default is no one in jail, um, it's going to be a long road ahead if that actually carries out. What do you say to the officers in the NYPD whose morale is down when that when that city council in New York says, you know, you can't touch them here, you can't touch them there, stand down, the mayor wants you to stand down? And don't tell me that they weren't standing down when they were busting into some of the stores on Fifth Avenue. Uh, what was it, about six, five months ago? First yeah, of all, well, go ahead. What, what, what I will say was, you know, when, when they were breaking into those stores, 
we we were arresting them quicker than we could. Um, those laws put them right back on the street, which which is which is the tough part here. But what I say to them each and every day across New York City for the last two years is, you know, hold the line. Um, throughout COVID, 63 members uh, that we lost, 20% of the workforce sick, uh, defund, being attacked. Um, it was no doubt, you talked about morale, the toughest time that I've ever seen in 30 years, but incredibly proud of two things, not just that they, they held the line. And, and I'm talking about record numbers of gun arrests that we've made more than in 25 years, right. showing up to work in the toughest circumstances, but also doing it. And here's the most important thing, because it cannot be law enforcement versus everyone else. We're doing it together with the community. I think we have a, a phenomenal relationship with the people of New York City across every neighborhood, every ethnicity. I really, truly believe that, Judge. But um, what, what's I hope happening so. is uh, we do. We do. And, it, and it's a combination of smart policing and, and investments in time and energy into neighborhood policing and relationships. It's, it's just this. Well, community policing. Grabbing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's important. What would you say to Bill de Blasio on your way out? Uh, you know, there's nothing that I'm going to say that I haven't said. Uh, many well, times. tell me. Maybe I haven't heard it. You know, it, it, is he well, an idiot? We, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I thank him for selecting me as the 44th police yep, commissioner. Yep, I, get that. I, I don't I don't see eye to eye on every single issue. We've had a, a good relationship, um, but I also haven't been shy about voicing when things need to be. But, but, but he, so I'll, he I'll, I'll basically destroyed the department and the department morale while you were police commissioner. I mean, he's got to get some reaction from from you as the head of the police. I don't care if you're PBA or anything else. The bottom line is he destroyed the police. When I saw when I saw this past summer, you know, people walking up to police and spitting at them and screaming at them within an within an inch of their face. I wanted to go out there and slap them. You know, it's it's disgusting that that de Blasio allowed this. So I would expect you to be a little more angry about that creep, but that's well, just me. Yeah, well, 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 I would. What I would say is, uh, uh, you know, take a look at those those year, year two years. This was much wider than New York City. Unfortunately, yeah. you saw. You know, this is the the profession as a whole has never seen attacks like we have seen, and I'm going back twenty, thirty years. Yeah, I know. Um, police officers being shot disrespect for police officers we, we have a we have a long way to go um what i wish was that people would come together you know rather than you know attacking each other and, yeah, and but how are you going to do that don't always help how are you going to uh, do that you got to start from the ground yeah you, you have to you, you have to start from the ground and it's got to be um the people saying these are our police don't attack and and you're starting yeah. to see that Watch the video from Albany last week and the, and the mother that stands in front of the camera and looks right into it and says, I'm not worried about the NYPD. I'm not worried about the police. I'm worried about other people hurting my kids yeah. or, or, or with the, the other mother that says, you know, we know our police commissioner. He's out in the streets with us. People are, are connected. And that's what we have to keep building oh, on. Good for you. And, and the electeds will get it. They'll they'll get it eventually, or they're going to be looking for a new job. Okay. Let me ask you, what's next for you, Commissioner? Private industry, and uh, you know, I'll be I'll be local in New York. That's my belief. Yeah. Okay. Well, we appreciate your coming on Tunnel to Towers. <laughs> I got to tell you, I am so angry. Uh, because the, he, as far as I'm concerned, he ruined the department. And, uh, you know, you're a steady hand. I can see it. I hear it. You're very steady. Uh, but, man, you know, what he has done, what he has done, and I don't care if they do it in L.A., Chicago, Philadelphia, Atlanta, St. Louis, Baltimore. I don't give a damn. New York City had the best police department in the world, and that man single-handedly destroyed the the morale, the pride, and the energy of that department. He's a he's a creep. I can't wait for him to go. But we're sorry to see you go. And uh, <laughs> well, for, for, yeah, what what would what 
one message. What message to uh, Kachan Sewell, who will be the 45th police commissioner? What would you say to her? To the next commissioner? Yeah. Key oh, well, we've well. already we've already spoken several times, and uh, I, I tell you, I, I hear very good things. Um, the one message is trust your heart and do the right thing. And and it's not going to be easy, but it's the most rewarding job she's ever going to have. I have no doubt. So oh. I think she's going to do a phenomenal job. Oh, that's great. And and what about Eric Adams? You ever work with him? Uh, believe it or not, I've, I've known Eric more um, after his time with the PD. We were from different parts of the city. So I get along well with him. Uh, yeah. You know, we can pick up the phone and call each other. I, I think he was very smart and read the tea leaves quicker than anyone else and, and pivoted wisely to a tough on crime message. And he's, he's now the next mayor. So yeah. uh, he's got to carry through on all that. He's got to support his cops. That doesn't mean let them do anything, you know, hold them accountable, certainly. Yep. Um, but he's got to support them, too, because they're doing a heck of a tough job. Yep, yeah, indeed. All right. Thank you so much to the 44th Police Commissioner of New York City, Dermot Shea. Have a wonderful holiday. Merry Christmas. Right. And thank you. You too, Judge. Thanks all right. Take care. Tip in the scales when all else fails. The Judge Janine Tunnel to Towers Foundation Sunday Morning Show. Now, here's Judge Janine Pirro. Welcome back to the Judge Janine Pirro Tunnel to Towers Foundation Sunday Morning Show. All right, you know what time it is. It's time to reveal our question of the week. Last week, we posed this question. Do you believe that the Cuomo brothers will find another job, or it should be, will find other jobs consistent with their talents like one was a cnn contributor the other was a governor like what could they do consistent with their talents the question was posed after chris and andrew of course lost their respected positions in media and state government in the past few months what a shame we asked you the listening audience if andrew or chris would find new positions in their professional field This is shocking. The results are shocking. I tell you, shocking. So here are the results. Zero percent said yes, and 100 percent said no. The now disgraced Cuomo brothers will not find new positions consistent with their talents. So that's no surprise. I mean, well, what's Andrew Cuomo going to do? I mean, think about it. Is he going to run for governor in New Jersey? Is he going to run for governor in Arkansas? You know, maybe California. That might work. I mean, uh, you know, it just it's nonstop. Uh, it, it's nonstop violations of all the norms out there for those celebrities, and they just don't care. So in any event, for this week's upcoming question of the week, now, I'm thinking about we've got the police, the new police commissioner coming in. We had uh, the 44th police commissioner, uh, Dermot Shea, who, by the way, is he's a very even keeled guy, very unflappable, you know, Didn't get excited. Nothing. Uh, but we've got this new one, Kishan Sewell. I like the way she looks. I'm reading about her. I, it sounds like she's going to be tough on crime in New York City. But um, my question of the week is. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, do you feel less safe in New York City than you did before COVID? Do you feel less safe in New York City than you did before COVID? Now, I was thinking about do you feel, you know, safe on public transportation in New York City? You know what? I'm going to change it. I'm going to do the second one. Do you feel safe on public transportation in New York City? Okay, so whether it's the subway, whether it's the trains going into New York City, uh, do you feel safe on public transportation in New York City? I'm very curious to find out the results of that. So make sure you chime into the conversation and vote. All you have to do is log on to our website at wabcradio.com forward slash tag forward slash web dash poll. That's wabcradio.com. You do a forward slash the word tag, a forward slash the word web, then dash the word poll. So I'm going to be reading the results of the question of the week next Sunday live right here on 77 WABC. All right, we're almost out of time, but there's a couple things I want to talk about. 
you know, as we approach the holiday, uh, it was it was wonderful having Mitch Album on the show. I mean, he's such a positive, inspirational guy uh, who talks about things that 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 we don't talk about. And it was very interesting that he said that in this country, as I thought, we don't spend a lot of time talking, you know, dying, which is inevitable. Uh, and we don't respect the elderly the way we do in other countries. And, uh, you know, I wish that would be different. I really do. Um, I also think that, uh, um, you know, Dermot Shea and, and the interview with Dermot uh, was really a testament to the fact that, you know, there are police who are still working for us in New York City who still put their lives on the line. Uh, it's a, it's a you-know-what show. Uh, for them every day when they go out. And we have to kind of thank them. So when you see a police officer, you know, give them a thanks, give them a, you know, uh, just a hello, anything to let them know we do appreciate what they do. I think it's this, that time of year when we kind of have to put our put our lives in order a little bit, think about what we want to do next year, you know, how it should be different, how it should be better, what we can do. Uh, and next week, I'm going to talk about some of that stuff when we talk about, you know, the new year and uh, what we want to change. So uh, I can't believe that we're out of time already, but I want to make sure that you join us right back here next Sunday at 11 a.m. sharp for the Judge Jeanine Pirro Tunnel to Towers Foundation Sunday morning show. Uh, up next, it's the Dick Morris Show, where you can listen to great political commentary on the issues you care about. The guy's a genius, everybody. I, he's just his brain. You know, it needs to be saved for generations. He is a real political genius. Happy Sunday, everyone. Have a good week. You know what? Be good to yourselves. Take care of yourselves. God bless. Bye.